All right, we are recording, uh, and I'll hand over the floor to um, group number seven. All right, thank you so much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ben Curley. I'm a fourth year mechanical engineering major with a focus on computer science. My name is Nick Hansen. I'm also a fourth year en mechanical engineering major at, with a physics minor, and I would love to go into the renewable energy industry. Hi, everyone. I'm Stefan Piszkowski. I am a third year mechanical engineering student minoring in computer science, and I am looking to go into the software engineering industry. And I'm Christopher Supic, a fourth year mechanical engineering student with a minor in computer science. And we are group seven. Today we'll be presenting to you the quad flector. Now, start us off, we're going to briefly go over the quad flector's hedgehog concept, highlighting uh, which aspects of its design differentiate it from other competing concepts. Following this, we'll take a moment to discuss in short the design choices and unique features of the quad flector. Uh, then we'll take a few moments to discuss in greater detail the subsystems of the quad flector and how each aspect of the design was chosen to fulfill the customer needs. Uh, following our discussion of the subsystems, we'll move on to a description of our included electrical components, diving into how they cooperate to provide the desired resolution uh, for a minimal power draw. And then finally, we'll have a brief overview of the costs associated with employing a field of quad flectors before opening up the floor for questions. Uh, next slide. So the quad flector was designed on the condition of modularity. The replacement of a single component should never require a complete disassembly of a subsystem. And it was through this core belief that we arrived at an open air concept, enabling a hassle-free maintenance and assembly of the module. For, uh, of course, this open air concept required great consideration for resistance to the elements in Nevada. Each subsystem is designed such that the wind conditions of Nevada will naturally clear moving uh, components of dust and minor debris while maintaining functionality. However, should any major components fail due to end of life cycle or external factors, replacement parts are cheap to replace, not to mention the low skill of assembly enables maintenance and assembly to safely be carried out by low skill laborers. And take it over to the next one for me. Now, for a general overview of our proposed design, the quad flector is designed to meet the required power output with 2,605 modules. While this number is above some of the other proposed designs, the field space required is ultimately lesser due to the low profile of 44 hundredths of a meter high, enabling individual modules to be closer to one another without blocking. The quad flector stands as two rows of mirrors in parallel for a total of four reflective surfaces. While each mirror has a single independent method of actuation for rotation about the roll axis, all four mirrors share rotation about the pitch axis. This design greatly simplifies the controller for the system as well as the cost of manufacture and assembly. Now, sporting a total footprint area of a single square meter, the quad flector has a natural resistance to toppling due to excitation, especially once paired with the four rebar staples that firmly secure it to the ground with an eight inch deep concrete cylinder that uh, is poured around it and buried into the ground. And now I'm just going to go ahead and throw it over to Nick to go over our subsystems. All right, thanks, Ben. So as you can see, the frame is a square shape and is one meter squared uh, in dimension. And the main beams for support are two by four pieces of wood. The beams are held together with nails in each corner and an additional wood glue adhesive. And if you look at the two bottom beams, uh, you can see grooves there that are where the staples are housed. Um, and those staples are housed in concrete pillars, four in total, which can be seen on the model and are situated in the ground. Um, a force of 1,023 mega newtons would be needed to uproot the module from the ground, which is well above any natural forces um, that would be experienced by our module. The wood is also pressure treated, meaning it should be able to withstand normal weather conditions experienced in the Las Vegas desert. And in the event of severe weather damage from unforeseen circumstances, the wood is also easily accessible and could be replaced. The open concept with no bottom uh, and raised beams also prevents water and debris from uh, pooling in the design. And the wood frame will only fail from a force of one mega Newton, which is also a force unexperienced from the natural conditions. So now we'll discuss our mirrors. Um, our mirrors are also a square shape uh, and it is a 0.4 meter by 0.4 meter silver glass piece. The silver glass is relatively cheap and has a high reflectivity 
And the main factor in being chosen was its hardness and ability to weather the ambient conditions. Other materials were taken into account, such as marler film. However, silvered glass was the only material that seemed to be able to well weather the conditions. The glass is also chemically inert, meaning a variety of cleaners would be able to be used on it and it would not rust or corrode. Uh, also, general maintenance would only need to include uh, mirror surface cleaning rather than full replacement of damaged mirrors since they would like be likely to undergo uh, little damage and experience essentially no scratching. The total reflective area of one module is 0.64 square meters, which is uh, inside the required one square meter. And this was determined to coincide with the one meter frame to optimize the blocking ratio uh, between adjacent mirrors. So no shading or blocking occurs within each module. And now I'll hand it over to Chris to discuss the analysis of those mirrors. Thanks, Nick. So we performed a thermal analysis on the mirrors in order to scale our heliostat module up to a full scale uh, solar collection field. Um, and in order to reach the requested power input of one megawatt, the field would need to consist of 2,605 heliostats. Uh, this number was found by using a surface irradiance of 1,000 watts per meter squared, as well as an optical efficiency of 60%. The optical efficiency assumes a worst case scenario based on optical losses due to tracking errors as well as thermal resistance. The solar concentration ratio was also met using the field size and its calculation is seen on the right hand side of the slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the mirror frame itself consists of three ABS plastic pieces connected with L brackets as well as mirror trims on the end of each frame piece. This modular design allows each piece to be easily replaced as well as easy removal and installation of the mirror. The gap in the trim allows the mirror to sit in the frame while also allowing for changes in volume due to thermal expansion. A soft insulating foam is also used in each trim to prevent wobbling while protecting the mirror. And I'll now throw it over to Ben to go over the mirror actuation system. All right. So displayed for you now are two methods of actuation. Uh, on the left is the stepper motor, which drives the actuation for the shared pitch axis of rotation. Uh, a single motor drives a tension belt, which rotates the main crossbars of the system, upon which each heliostat is mounted. On the right, we have the method utilized to actuate each mirror independently from the other three along the roll axis. A servo motor drives the arm of each heliostat through a two-gear train, and we'll discuss the numerical analysis for each of these systems in just a moment. If we could take it over to the next slide. So before you now is a demonstration of the shared axis of actuation. As stated previously, the stepper motor drives a single belt, which rotates the rows forward and backward across the pitch axis. And then there you are. So now in front of you is the motion study of the independent actuation of a single mirror about the roll axis. As can be seen, the servo motor rotates the smaller driving gear and in turn rotating the larger driven gear, which drives the attached heliostat arm and pivots the mirror left and right. Next slide, please. So the shared axis actuation method drives the two rows of mirrors via the main crossbars as stated prior, upon which two heliostats are mounted per bar. The main housing is secured to the frame via four quarter inch wood screws. And then to prevent any frictional losses, each crossbar is equipped with nylon brushings at each end, which slide right into the mounting brackets. The crossbars are then secured against the axial displacement via snap rings before each pulley is attached and secured via a set screw. As you can see, the belt drops around the, uh, the pulley wheels there. So now if we can take over the next one. Uh, here for you now is the numerical analysis for determination of our stepper motor's required torque output. Uh, it accounts for wind forces applied to all four mirrors at once, assuming half of the momentum exits the control volume uh, through the exiting mass flow rate of the air. In combination with the weights of each mirror and accounting for the required factor of safety, it was determined that the stepper motor requires a 1.03 Newton meter torque after accounting for the mechanical advantage provided by the pulley wheel size variance. With our chosen motor output, we arrived with 1.26 Newton meters given the mechanical advantage. So well above the requirement for to meet our factor of safety limits. 
And if uh, Stefan could go ahead and take over from here. Thank you, Ben. So the rotary rods of the shared actuation system each support the weight of two reflectors and two independent actuation systems. The material selection of the rotary rod was important because we wanted to minimize the deflection of the beam due to the bending force from the weight of the reflectors and the actuation systems. The beam's deflection can negatively impact the solar tracking capability of the heliostat by shifting the angle of the reflector relative to the target tower. So we did a simply supported beam deflection analysis and we set the deflection to a maximum allowable value and solved for the required elastic modulus. The aluminum was selected over the other materials with similar elastic moduli due to its relatively low cost, its corrosion resistance, non-reactivity, and ease of machining. The elastic modulus of aluminum ended up exceeding the minimum needed by about 50 gigapascal with a safety factor of five. Each of the four reflectors is equipped with its own actuation system that operates independently. The independent axis of rotation will account for the shifting of the sun's position as the seasons change. A large gear is attached to the mirror mount arm with set screws and a keyhole to keep it from rotating relative to the arm. And a smaller gear is powered by a servo motor and drives the larger gear with a ratio of four to one and a resolution of 33 thousandths of a degree. This will be precise enough to track the sun, which from Earth has an angular diameter of half a degree. The MG995 servo motor supplies the necessary actuation power with a great resolution at an affordable price. Its working frequency is 50 hertz with maximum speed of 16 hundredths of a second per 60 degrees, and its maximum torque output is 1.274 newton meters. The resolution of the motor paired with the four to one gear ratio that it operates gives us over 3000 unique positions throughout the required 105 degrees of rotation. These 105 degrees of rotation are necessary to track the sun's seasonal changes in position. The 10 Newton weight of the reflector and reflector frame produce a torque about the center of the larger gear that is maximized when the 20 centimeter long arm is rotated furthest away from the vertical. At this position, the arm makes a 52 and a half degree angle relative to the horizontal. After transferring the torques and forces through the gears, the maximum torque necessary to rotate the reflector is 0.4 Newton meters. So the motor's 1.274 Newton meters of maximum torque output satisfies this needed torque by a factor of three. Uh, and now on to Chris to talk about electronics. Thanks, Stefan. So I'll briefly walk us through our electronic system. Our electronics, electronics system consists of an Arduino Uno, an Espressif ESP32 wireless chip, as well as an A4988 stepper driver. The basis of our design revolves around controlling the entire field through a central control computer. The Arduino receives heliostat positioning data as well as, as, as extreme weather warnings through the ESP32, which it can then use to control each of our motors. A breadboard is used to connect all of the components. Our stepper motor is driven through an A4988 stepper driver. The driver converts the signal to an actuation step. Our driver also enables micro-stepping up to a 16th step, reducing our overall motor resolution to 0 0.113 degrees. In regards to calibrating the stepper motor, a limit switch is installed to enable initial positioning on startup. The servo motor can be directly connected to the Arduino due to the servo motor's built-in functionality of handling positioning data. Finally, the core electronics of our system are housed inside of an ABS plastic enclosure. This enclosure protects the electronics from rain and dust by having each side enclosed. Slits are located at the bottom of the enclosure to provide cooling through air ventilation. Due to the positioning of the slits, we don't anticipate sand to be blown up through them. And another design choice that was made to facilitate cooling is the placement of the enclosure beneath the wooden frame. The frame shades the enclosure from direct sunlight meaning that the only relevant source of heat will be from the electronics and the ambient air. And I will now throw it over to Ben to go over the pricing. So 
display for you now is the estimated cost breakdown for manufacturer assembly and operating costs associated with a single heliostat on the right column and the entire field on the left. Our estimated labor cost is under the assumption of the hire of two construction workers for a total of half an hour's work at $16 an hour each. Our manufacturing costs associated with the non-OTS parts are incredibly minimal, which was critical for justifying our inclusion of them. Also, is the, uh, also visible is the electrical cost for operating a single heliostat, then extrapolated out to the energy consumption in a single day for the entire field. So ultimately, uh, yeah, if you could just take over to the next slide, sorry. So ultimately, the quad flector is built on a reliance of autonomy. By being robust and easy to maintain, little supervision is required by any governing body, enabling a set and uh, a set and forget mindset. The overall low cost of manufacture and assembly and its modular design combine to create an optimal experience for the customer. Not to mention, the open air design enables ease of operation and maintenance, overall decreasing the cost of maintenance in the long term. So, if we could take over to the next slide now, please. In conclusion, the quant flector ultimately meets the required power output for the one megawatt uh, for the methane reforming reactor. It's easy to assemble and maintain, enabling long-term savings. And just ultimately, the quad flector is the correct choice for you. Uh, I'd like to take this moment to thank you all for coming today for our presentation. And if we could go ahead and open the floor up now for questions, we're ready to answer whatever you have for us. All right. Um, do we have any questions from our panel? Yeah, Dr. Tron, this is Rick Miles from North of Grumman. I'll start. So uh, when looking at your hedgehog concept, right, uh, you talked about uh, low cost, rapidly prototyped plastic parts um, and using 3D printed parts to cut the manufacturing time and cost. Which of your parts are you planning on being 3D printed? Um, I didn't see that elsewhere in the presentation to really understand which ones were going to be 3D printing. Well, we have our, we plan on 3D printing our mirror frame since it's made out of an ABS plastic, as well as our housing for the electronics, which is mounted underneath of the uh, wooden frame. So, yeah. Okay. So, so I can kind of see that from a, a prototyping standpoint, right? But from a a manufacturing standpoint, if you're going to go mass produce these things, you're going to want to do something like injection molding or something like that. So I'm just curious how you came to your cost on your uh, those things that you're planning to 3D print. Well, we got uh, we got a quote for the ABS plastic that would be required for printing, and then looked at how much it would cost to print a single set of those parts with the machine operation time, and then uh, extrapolated that out to the cost of equipping the entire field with the 3D printed frame and the 3D printed housing for the electronics. Uh, we didn't, if I recall, when we took a look at injection molding, uh, I, think, I can't remember what our rationale was for going with 3D printing. I believe it was just that it was a lot simpler uh, overall, but I could see why injection molding could uh, also be a good uh, solution for our problems. Yeah, I, I would say your, your geometry is fairly simple for, for things and it, it, it seems like that your cost would be very cheap along those things. Um, so kudos, um, I, I like the fact uh, when you went and did uh, your beam analysis, it was just a simple hand calculation. Uh, I really liked that. Um, I, I, thought, I thought that was good. Um, and uh, you had nice uh, pictures to tell me how you were applying the force uh, in different areas. Uh, I, I love to see something that at least is representative of a free body. So uh, I appreciate that as well. Uh, good job on that. I do question with your... Um, wood. Uh, so if you go back to the beginning where you show your, your just the initial picture, um, let's see here. Yeah. So what is, what is uh, holding the wood to the concrete? Is, is, is that just 
like metal staples as you? Yes. So uh, there are grooves in those, I, I guess for lack of a better word, the ones that are perpendicular to the yes. rotating crawl. Whoops, sorry, accidentally muted myself. And then those, they wrap around over the top of the uh, two by four and then are placed down inside of the, about, I believe it was eight inches of a concrete cylinder that's poured around it. Like you dig out a hole, stick the staples in, pour the concrete in. Okay, so if, I, if I'm thinking about your mirrors here, are, uh, and I see those concrete posts, are those concrete posts there completely buried or is some of that concrete post actually above ground? We calculated for it to be completely buried. Okay, so so then I, I, I question your wood over time. I, I, I think uh, you're going to have issues with warping, especially uh, right where you're going to have a lot of moisture collect on. Uh, again, I know it's Nevada. Nevada tends to be fairly dry, but you're going to have moisture collect on the ground. That's going to, over time, uh, I think, tend to warp uh, your wood. I, I do like the fact that uh, you're considering uh, things to keep your costs down. Um, so, so I, I do like uh, that overall approach. I'm just concerned that that might cause you problems as uh, you move forward uh, into the future there. And then uh, with the concrete post, there's nothing else other than the post going in, into the ground, right? So it's not like a bit, because I think I heard someone say a concrete pad. So is it a concrete pad or just these four concrete posts going in? Um, at each location? Uh, it's just the four concrete posts. Okay. All right. So, so uh, uh, my concern is if it was a concrete pad, there might be some additional thermal effects to take into account, but um, uh, I don't have that concern now. Um, that's all I've got for right now. Uh, so good if job. I, if I may add, essentially the concrete posts, they're supposed to be post holes dug and then the concrete poured in, and then the staples are more of like stakes, but they look like staples and they're gonna go in and harden with the concrete. Okay, so, so I guess that drives one more question before I let you go. Uh, the labor to go dig the holes and install the uh, thing, I'm assuming that's not, is that or is that not in your manufacturing labor assembly labor cost? That that's is in the uh, assembly labor cost. If you recall, we had mentioned that the assembly labor was under the assumption of hiring two construction workers uh, right. each at $16 an hour for a half hour total assembly. That's the cost of taking it out to the field, digging the posts because they're only eight inches. So the post holes take no time at all to dig out or the concrete, put everything together. We went for a very open air, very simplistic, robust design in order to make it so that you don't need full-time engineers going out there to main, uh, to assemble and maintain these things. Okay. All right. Okay. I will jump in and you're actually on the correct slide. So perfect. Um, first, thank you guys so much for including manufacturing and laboring costs. You wouldn't believe how many people don't include that information. And as you can see, that's a you know, it is a significant part of your heliostat. It's not just tiddly watt money. So thank you guys very much for considering that and putting that in here. Um, the I I'm not an engineer by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, so the other engineers in this group may be able to speak more on this. Um, you said you were going to hire two construction workers to assemble it and essentially it's 30 minutes per unit to assemble. Will the construction worker, I understand that your heliostat simple, but you gotta, will the construction workers have enough knowledge, you know, on how to put these actually together? Because I can tell you, if you gave it to me, granted a construction worker has probably gotten more knowledge than me on a lot of this, but if you gave it to me, I wouldn't have the foggiest. So I just, you know, kind of want some feedback thoughts on that. Yeah, so we actually have a whole manual of how to put everything together. Mm -hmm. uh, it's currently in the works. Um, and it shows a step-by-step -step guide for how to assemble it. It's supposed to be 
um, describing in detail how to do each step of the way. So even somebody that's never seen it before should be able to assemble it as long as they know how to operate basic um, uh, equipment and uh, construction tools. I would highly suggest when you make that, and this is what I tell people when they talk to me engineering, it, speak to me like I'm a five-year-old. So I, when you're, when you're putting that together, just remember, you know, the, the simpler you can explain it, usually the better. Because if you were to give it to me, if it's literally not like put the orange screw in the orange hole, then I'm probably not going to get it. But I'm really glad to hear that you guys do have, um, you've thought about that, you know, okay, how are we going to make sure that this is put together correctly? Yes, uh, it's uh, actually modeled from uh, how Lego books are. We try to make it <laughs> very similar. Very nice. I love it. Good idea. Um, da, da, da. The second thing in the kind of left field from all of this um, is I want to thank you guys for all dressing up, looking professional, sounding professional. You know, you all have the same background. You wouldn't believe how little things like this really do affect. I'm coming at this from an investor's perspective, right? So I'm coming at this with a business mind. I'm coming at this with a money mind. I'm coming at this. Do I want to give out half a million dollar to you guys? You know, so when you come presenting yourself looking like you have your act together, um, you know, it, whether or not you do or don't, it looks like you do because you all are dressed nicely. Your presentation is very professional. You know, you have very clean colors on your slides. You all look the same. You know, it's, it, it's perspective and it all is just visuals, but it really does make a difference, those little details. So I wanna thank you guys very much for, you know, taking it seriously. And even if you don't have your act together, you look like you do, so fake it till you make it. Thank you, we appreciate it. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Okay, so is it my turn? It is. Okay, so um, your motors are RC servo motors. Correct. And you have three of them. Uh, we have four. One for four. each Helios set. Yep. Oh, the and what drives? Uh, do you have motors that aren't RC servos? Yes. So we have four uh, RC servo motors, and then one stepper motor, driving the belt pulley. Okay. Okay. Never mind then. So, how many how many drivers do you have? Uh, we have one, one driver. Okay. So it was a little confusing to me. I thought you had like, uh, yeah, I thought you had like one stepper to, I, I've seen too many of these, but um, <laughs> so yeah. It's, it's so, one, one stepper that drives the belt. Um, okay. That is the only one that needs a driver. And then four servos, those are for the individual axis and uh and they have required. all the driver baked in and you can't improve yep. the resolution and all right. of that yeah they had a um, very low res already yeah, I, they, the, the, we, the only thing i would say about that is when you do your thermo analysis that stepper driver it will be a significant source of heat um i would just uh assuming that it's 10 percent of the power that the motor is drawing goes into heat generated by the stepper driver. And if you, the little picture you have shows it has a little fin on it. So that's kind of a clue that it gets hot. So um, yeah, that's all pretty good. And I think I had one more. Oh <laughs> yeah, something that kind of like really stood out to me when you went through why you chose aluminum and it being relatively cheap. Um, how old was your data? And it could have been three weeks old and that still would be really old in this environment. We, uh, this semester has been the most unstable economics I have seen since I was your age, since I was our, in college. And when it our was- <laughs> Yeah, our aluminum cost data we pulled very early on in the design process because we, when we were doing our analysis on machinability and you know just overall ease of manufacture, we're like, oh, aluminum, steel is much harder than aluminum, and it's way harder than we need it to be. So let's just we'll go with aluminum. That's cheap. It's available. Uh, we haven't 
updated as inflation has driven it through the roof. Yeah, and um, honestly, for, for, for your lives, the economic situation has been unusually stable. And, and you've had the dollar menu since you were born and the price hasn't gone up, which is um, the extreme other end of the fluctuation of the market. So do prepare yourself to see a little more wild rides now and then, and you just have to roll with it. Um, that's all I got. Just to tag Thank along you. on that, if you want a, a good idea, go look at a comparison to build a house two years ago or mm, three years ago, I guess now pre-COVID to the cost to build a house nowadays. It will uh, severely shock you. Oh yeah, those have gone up a lot. <laughs> and guess what? A lot of those materials are similar to what you guys are using. So Yeah, just, definitely. Yeah. That was also... Fun. Funnily enough, that was also part of what drove us toward a baseline for hiring laborers to assemble these things, being construction workers, is, well, we're using a lot of the same materials that they would be used, they, they would be used to working with. Like, we're using two by fours that are pressure treated, we're using self-tapping wood screws, like, and we're pouring concrete. Like, who does that all day, every day? Construction workers, Yeah. All right. Um, do we have any more questions from the yeah, panel? Dr. Tron, this right, Miles. I've got I've got one yeah. more question. So if we could go to the uh, uh, slide with the calculation of the torque due to wind. No, not that one. Um, I think those are the shared. Yeah, no, that one. So uh, I I guess I'm I'm confused as to what made you choose ten miles per hour for the wind. Because I, I I know we we have to be concerned about it uh, being safe in like a max wind condition, which I know is much more than ten miles per hour. So I'm I'm curious as to what drove the the ten miles per hour used here. That's interesting. That must have been a mistake because initially we had our max operating condition as I believe like twenty four miles an hour, and then our maximum safe during like holding the position was thirty eight. I think uh, what we ended up going with actually was we have a safe setting where the mirrors uh, come to a perfectly flat uh, orientation. And that's when it's extreme wind conditions that aren't very frequent, aren't very often, but they are extreme and they might cause problems with the functioning of the heliostat module. Yeah, so this calculation was more off of uh, more of the average wind speeds and when the um, when the module is is in like its worst position. So that's kind of what this calculation was based off of. Yeah, and okay. this, isn't a, this isn't a holding torque. This is a continuing to rotate during that wind speed torque calculation. So our stationary mile, like our stationary rated wind speeds are much higher than this. And then we have our safe mode for anything that exceeds our safe holding position. Okay, and then just a, a word of advice. Um, when you are showing two different sets of units, so here you've got English units, miles per hour, and metric units, right, everything else. You, you need some sort of reference point on that page to help my brain go from one to the other. So I, I see you've got your speed of 4.47 meters per second. Um, is that your 10 miles per hour? Because I'm, I'm not very good at going back and forth between the conversions. I can usually work very well in one system or the other at a time, but going back and forth, it's, it's, it's usually not so easy for me to turn on and off uh, what, what those numbers should look like. Yeah, that, that is for the 10 miles per hour. We, sh we should have uh, included that on the slide, but I guess we just forgot to put it in. So sorry. About no, no, that. you know, those, those, those are just little uh, things that I find but when, when uh, watching presentations, those things that I wish that would be done right. So that's why I'm passing that along to you. Um, yeah, definitely. Thank you. And, and then the other thing I would just say that there were some points on some of the slides where I felt like you gave too many significant figures. Um, so, 
for example, if I was to go back up to your mirror analysis slide, right, where you've got the, the CGO of 1,000.32, um, I, I, I guess that's okay, but every, everything else seems to be somewhat rounded off. So, so going, going there uh, seems a little odd to me. A thousand, I think, would have, would have been okay. Um, and in general, uh, the, the numbers look pretty good, but to just be aware that uh, you know, the more significant figures uh, you put, the more we expect you to be able to hit those numbers, right? And so if they're, they're not important to go that far out, then, then, then don't do that. Um, so same thing even with uh, your, your cost slide. I, I would have just rounded to even dollars instead of putting cents, especially when you talk anything beyond a thousand bucks, no one's going to care about what the pennies are. Right. So um, it, just just little things that uh, catch people's eye. Yeah, that makes complete sense. But uh, excellent job, guys. Re really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your, okay. your questions. Yeah. All right. I hope we uh, made it clear that the function, the way the functionality of the actuation systems were. Okay, uh, let's see. Are there any any final questions before we wrap up? Nope. Okay, great. Well, then we'll we'll call it a wrap there. Uh, thanks, guys, for um, sharing your your design with us this afternoon uh, and all your hard work over the course of this semester in in Mech two. Um, hopefully, we'll be seeing most of you in Mech three in the not too distant future. So, uh, and if you're lucky, you might end up to working on another heliostat design for Mech 3. So we'll see. Anyway, okay, I'm gonna stop recording.